All right, so I've wanted to do a review of neuroanatomy, uh, which is mainly from first year neuroscience, but I'll make some applications to what we're doing now in clinical neurology. And so this is rather ambitious here, but uh, we're gonna break this up into several parts. Um, in this lecture, I'm gonna go over the motor system. We'll talk about upper motor neurons, basal ganglia and cerebellum, and how all these are involved in movement. Uh, we'll go over eye movements, and we'll talk about vision, visual pathways, and we'll finish with just a little bit on the pupil. All right, so uh, first I'll just talk about uh, some upper motor neuron pathways. Uh, here's the cortical bulbar tract, a very important upper motor neuron pathway. And so we'll see that this uh, begins here, originates mostly in the precentral gyrus, and this travels through the genu of the internal capsule, that's important. And the cortical bulbar tract is basically the upper motor neuron control over brainstem lower motor neurons, right? So notice here the trigeminal nucleus. So that would be motor nucleus for uh, chewing, uh, for example. Um, here is the facial nucleus. Uh, the facial nucleus has a division for the upper face and the lower face, okay? And here's the nucleus ambiguous. That's the motor nucleus for 9 and 10. Hypoglossal nucleus, obviously, for 12. And spinal accessory for 11. So all of these are lower motor neurons in the brainstem. They're lower motor neurons because they directly supply muscles. Trigeminal muscles, facial muscles, swallowing, talking muscles, spinal accessory, uh, for sternocleidomastoid and um, trapezius. So notice that the cortical bulbar tract supplies all of these muscles, uh, both ipsilateral and bilateral, with the exception here of the part of the facial nucleus for the uh, lower face. So let's show another drawing to illustrate that. All right, so here's the cortical bulbar tract supplying the contralateral upper and lower face division of the facial nucleus. Okay, but notice that the ipsilateral supply is only to the portion of the nucleus for the upper face. Okay, so what that means then is if we have an upper motor neuron lesion, uh, let's say of the genu of the internal capsule, then what will be deprived um, in this case will be the lower facial division. All right, so when a patient has a stroke, it's usually the lower face that is weak. Okay, contrast that with the lesion of the uh, facial nucleus or of the facial nerve, let's say a Bell's palsy, and that patient will have weakness of the entire side of the face. Forehead, uh, won't be able to close the eye. And so that's a distinction between an upper and a lower motor neuron uh, facial weakness. Okay, so here's the cortical bulbar tract in the genu. Okay, and it's worthwhile really spending some time with the internal capsules, a lot of important uh, neuroanatomy here. Remember the medial boundary is we have the caudate and the thalamus. Okay, and out laterally we have the internal and external segment of the globus pallidus and the putamen. So the anterior limb contains the frontal eye fields. Uh, we'll talk about that as an important pathway for eye movements. There's also an important connection we'll talk about in a few minutes here between the brain and the cerebellum called the cortical pontocerebellar tract. And there's an important connection here between the mammillary bodies and the thalamus. This is involved in Pape's circuit, an important pathway for memory. So the genu again contains the cortical bulbar tract. And in the posterior limb, we have the cortical spinal tract. That's very important. And adjacent to that, we also have the ascending thalamic radiations, or sometimes called the superior thalamic radiations. And this is sensation uh, going from the thalamus um, up to the postcentral gyrus. So pain, temperature, vibration, proprioception from the arms, legs, and face. So this is ascending, uh, whereas the cortical spinal tract is uh, descending. All right, so if we have a destructive lesion of the cortical bulbar tract, and I'm just gonna go back here to show the uh, diagram here, what's gonna happen? Well, this happens usually in patients that have various neurologic diseases that could be stroke, um, could be demyelination of the cortical bulbar tract, could even be ALS 
which is a motor neuron disease. You lose the neurons up here in ALS. And so as you lose more and more of the cortical bulbar tract, then the brain loses its ability to regulate these lower motor neurons. And this is especially prominent for the lower motor neurons here involved in talking and swallowing. So nucleus ambiguous, very important for uh, talking and swallowing. So a major symptom of lesions of the cortical bulbar tract is dysarthria and dysphagia. Okay, that's very prominent. Um, also, interestingly, if you lose a lot of the cortical bulbar tract, you get something called emotional incontinence. Um, these patients have a hard time controlling their emotions. So they may cry easily or laugh um, uncontrollably. Okay, and if you have a condition that involves a lot of the cort cortical bulbar tract, like a lot of strokes or demyelination, um, that tends to go along with dementia. Okay, and you would look for focal findings because, again, these patients usually have lots of pathways that are affected. So along with uh, dysarthria, dysphagia, emotional incontinence, they might have a hemiplegia from, or a visual field deficit or, or something else. So pseudobulbar palsy has a differential. Um, I just mentioned three causes, um, lots of subcortical strokes, uh, motor neuron disease, severe demyelinating disease like multiple sclerosis, and we'll see some uh, Parkinsonian syndromes, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy and multisystem atrophy. Uh, these conditions are associated with pseudobulbar palsy, and we'll talk about those in the uh, movement disorder lecture. All right, another uh, very important pathway, probably the one we talk about more than any other, is the cortical spinal tract. All right, so again, this originates a lot of the neurons in the precentral gyrus. And remember the importance of the crossing here, right at the junction between the medulla and the spinal cord, okay, to supply lower motor neurons on the opposite side of the spinal cord. So anterior horn cells here um, are the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord. All right, so remember the homunculus. Um, up here. So you have the face out here, uh, the arm and the hand, and then the leg. And so if we just follow the leg fibers here um, that contribute to the cortical spinal tract, so these are going to travel through the cerebral peduncle, through the basis pontus. Uh, the medulla is not shown here, but it would travel through the medullary pyramid and then cross, and it will go all the way down to supply anterior horn cells and the lumbosacral spine to move your leg and foot. Okay, if we follow the arm fibers, same thing, except now these are going to supply the cervical cord, um, lower motor neurons to move your hand and your arm. Okay, and notice, now we just refer to this as a separate pathway, but this is the cortical bulbar tract right here in purple. So it travels right along with the cortical spinal tract through the cerebral peduncle. But notice the cortical bulbar tract is supplying these lower motor neurons um, in the brain stem. So really the cortical bulbar tract and cortical spinal tract um, are the same pathway, but we give it different names depending on whether it supplies lower motor neurons in the brain stem um, or in the spinal cord. Now the cortical spinal tract um, you can see is more invested in the cervical cord. So um, its strongest function is to control the opposite arm, especially the hand. Um, there is an important columnar arrangement here. So here is the cortical spinal tract. Now this is at T1, all right? But just notice the sacral fibers are lateral and then lumbar and then thoracic. And if we were to draw this at the cervical level, we'd see the cervical fibers most medial. That's actually practical to know. Um, if you have a compressive lesion on the spinal cord and the, at the cervical level, for example, it's going to more likely affect the lumbosacral fibers, uh, which are lateral. All right, so over here we can see the cortical spinal tract. There's actually another pathway that travels along with this that I'll talk about. And so this is just to emphasize here that the cortical spinal tract is mainly invested in distal fine motor control, especially of the upper extremity. So it's part of the lateral motor system. Okay, so there, the other pathway that travels in the lower, uh, lateral motor system is the rubrospinal tract. Not nearly as important, 
all right? And it has a very similar function as the lateral corticospinal tract. So the rubrospinal tract originates in the midbrain. So here's the midbrain, okay? We've got the superior colliculi here, cerebral aqueduct, red nucleus. Here's the cerebral peduncle. And this, this nucleus right here is the subthalamic nucleus, which we'll talk about in a minute. All right, but there's the red nucleus. And so this is where the rubrospinal tract originates. And so there are a lot of upper motor neurons that originate in the brainstem. This is one of them. And the rubrospinal tract crosses pretty early um, from the nucleus. And so just like the cortical spinal tract, it supplies muscles, or I should say lower motor neurons on the opposite side. So it travels right along with the uh, lateral cortical spinal tract. And again, it's mainly invested in the upper extremity and in the hand, okay? So this would be about the location here of um, the cortical spinal tract and the rubrospinal tract. Now there are other upper motor neurons that originate from the brainstem that travel through what we call the medial motor system. And notice that these supply more proximal, midline, axial muscles, okay? And so these are worthwhile knowing the vestibulospinal tract, two of them, tectospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, and the anterior corticospinal tract. So let's go through these. First, the vestibulospinal tract. The lateral vestibulospinal tract, which originates from the lateral vestibular nucleus, is the major extensor upper motor neuron pathway in the brain. Very powerful extensor bias. And this pathway is important. In the coma lecture, we will talk about decerebrate posturing. These are almost always patients that are in a coma and um, they're observed to have strong extensor posturing in the arms and legs. And so the pathway you wanna associate with that is the lateral vestibulospinal tract. Okay, we'll explain the mechanism of that um, in the coma lecture. The medial vestibulospinal tract, um, this pathway is activated by the vestibular apparatus in the inner ear. So when you move your head, the semicircular canals are always sensing, sensing position of head in space. And this feeds into the medial vestibular nucleus. And this pathway um, communicates only with cervical anterior horn cells. So it's only interested in neck movement. And so uh, it's amazing when you think about it, when we walk or run or do anything, that our neck is always perfectly um, in the appropriate position relative to our body. So if you lurch forward, your neck tends to automatically move in the, in the right direction to counter that. And so that is the medial vestibulospinal tract um, that is involved in that. So we can just kind of imagine here these two pathways both being involved. So you slip on ice, what happens? Your arms and legs maybe extend in that moment. That's the lateral vestibulospinal tract. Uh, maybe as you're falling, you're tilting to one side, and so you need to turn your head in the opposite direction to overcome that. Uh, that would be the medial vestibulospinal tract. Okay, so all of these upper motor neuron pathways work together um, so that we can have very precise and accurate uh, movement in a variety of circumstances. All right, the tectospinal tract originates from the tectum, which is the quadrigeminal plate here. Okay, so we have the superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus. Okay, so the tectospinal tract starts there. And by the way, remember this is the dorsum of the midbrain. So right above that, you have the pineal gland. And right about above that, you have the thalamus on either side and the third ventricle. Okay, and what is below the inferior colliculus? There's a nerve right here coming out. It's the only nerve that exits the dorsum of the brainstem and that's the trochlear nerve, okay? But the tectospinal tract uh, originates here. Now remember the superior colliculus has to do with vision, not visual acuity, okay? But in this case, um, this pathway also only supplies cervical anterior horn cells. And so as it relates to vision, if you see something, let's say off to one side, and your neck perfectly turns your head in the direction of that, what you're looking at, what you want to look at, 
That's tectospinal tract from the superior colliculus. Okay? If you're able to turn your head appropriately towards an auditory um, stimulus, that's tectospinal tract from the inferior colliculus. All right, the reticulospinal tracts, um, one originates from the pons, another from the medulla, and um, won't go over these in detail, just to say that these supply truncal midline musculature. Okay, and then finally, the anterior cortical spinal tract. This is basically the 10 or 15% of the cortical spinal tract that does not cross in the pyramidal decussation. So it's uncrossed here in the medial motor system, but before it synapses in anterior horn cells, it does cross, all right? So really when neurologists talk about the cortical spinal tract, they're talking about the lateral cortical spinal tract. Okay, the anterior cortical spinal tract is a much smaller component that crosses lower down, and it's more invested in proximal muscles than the lateral um, cortical spinal tract. All right, so that's a brief um, big picture of upper motor neurons, and I wouldn't spend a long time with this, but just to kind of show why there are lots of upper motor neurons, so that you know the, the anterior horn cells and the spinal cord can be uh, very precisely uh, controlled for whatever activity it is um, that you're involved in. All right, so remember, what are lower motor neurons? Lower motor neurons supply muscle. And so in the spinal cord, we've talked about um, all these upper motor neurons here controlling uh, lower motor neurons, which will then become nerve roots, plexus, peripheral nerve, and then we've got a neuromuscular junction, and then finally out to muscle fibers. Okay, but you also have anterior horn cells in the brainstem, specialized. Um, we don't call them anterior horn cells, but they're just specialized anterior horn cells here in the brain stem. So the hypoglossal nucleus, okay, the nucleus ambiguous, the facial nucleus, here's the trigeminal motor nucleus, and then we have all of the motor nuclei involved in moving your eyes. Um, here's the um, spinal accessory nucleus um, down here. So uh, remember that the um, Brainstem lower motor neurons are controlled by the cortical bulbar tract. Okay, so next time we'll go over a little on the anatomy of lower motor neurons. Now let's talk about two systems that are involved in controlling the upper motor neurons. Okay, and, and those are the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. So the basal ganglia and cerebellum do not talk directly to lower motor neurons. They regulate and control upper motor neurons. And so this one coronal section shows you all the major components of the basal ganglia. First, we have the caudate. Okay, remember the caudate always bulges into the lateral ventricle. So that's the caudate. Okay, this is a section through the posterior limb of the internal capsule right here. And so lateral to that, we have the putamen right here and the globus pallidus. And hopefully you can see here there's an external and an internal portion um, of the globus pallidus, right? Medial here to the posterior limb of the internal capsule, and here's the cerebral peduncle, is a football-shaped nucleus, and this is the subthalamic nucleus. That's a very important um, part of basal ganglia circuitry. And of course, down here, we have the darkly, dark staining uh, substantia nigra. So um, we use the term the striatum to combine the caudate and the putamen because functionally the caudate and putamen work together. Okay, anatomically we talk about the lentiform nucleus because the putamen and globus pallidus has a lens shape. Okay, but functionally the striatum is much more important because when the Motor cortex talks to the basal ganglia, it talks to the striatum, it talks to the caudate and the putamen. Okay, then there's a complex circuit that happens in the basal ganglia, and the output back to the motor cortex is mainly right here from the internal segment of the globus pallidus. Okay, we'll discuss there's also a contribution from part of the um, substantia nigra, but most of this 
is from the internal segment of the globus pallidus. So all of this is really important, as we'll see, if you're going to understand why uh, in deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, why do we put the probe in the internal segment of the globus pallidus or in the subthalamic nucleus and not out in the uh, putamen? Okay, so there is a payoff for kind of understanding uh, how this circuit works. All right, so here's normal basal ganglia circuitry. So the big picture is, again, when the motor cortex talks to the basal ganglia, it talks to the striatum. Okay, so a lot of complex stuff happens here. Okay, we'll talk about this. But the output then, after all this happens, the output is mainly from the internal segment of the globus pallidus and a little bit from the pars reticulata of the substantia nigra. This is not the dopamine producing part of the substantia nigra. Okay, so this goes back out through the thalamus, through the VA of the thalamus, and then back to the motor cortex. Um, now, from the striatum, we have what's called a direct and an indirect pathway. The direct pathway uh, goes through these D1 dopamine receptors to the internal segment of the globus pallidus. The indirect pathway goes through two extra steps, through the D2 receptors to the external segment of the globus pallidus, to the subthalamic nucleus, and then to the output nucleus, the GPI. Okay, and then here is our pars compacta, the dopamine producing neurons, okay? And so notice dopamine projects up to the striatum. So the motor cortex talks to the striatum. Substantia nigra pars compactus talk, talks to the striatum. Okay. And so dopamine, you'll see here, activates D1 receptors in the striatum, and it inhibits D2 receptors. Okay. So there would be no reason, I think, to learn these neurotransmitters if there wasn't you know, something positive clinical that we get out of this. And there is. So um, how I remember this is glutamate, which is an, a stimulatory neurotransmitter, um, is a neurotransmitter involved either going to the cortex or out of the cortex. Okay, so we'll put two positive marks here because it's excitatory. Everywhere else, it's GABA. Okay, so from D2 to the external segment of the globus pallus, it's GABA. From there to the subthalamic nucleus, it's GABA. The output to the thalamus is GABA. And from D1 to the internal segment of the globus pallidus, it's GABA. So two inhibitory marks everywhere. The one exception is the output from the subthalamic nucleus. This is glutamate. Okay, so this stimulates mainly the internal segment of the globus pallidus. All right, so this is a very simplistic model of um, the wiring of the basal ganglia, okay? And the reason it's worthwhile to know is if you have a disease or some lesion of basal ganglia circuitry, um, the bottom line is if the net result of that condition is that you have less glutamate going back to the motor cortex, then the patient will slow down. They look like they have Parkinson's disease. Okay. If we have a lesion or disease of the basal ganglia that results in more glutamate going back to the motor cortex, now we have a hyperkinetic movement disorder. The patient is moving too much. Okay, so the easiest example uh, of that is if we have a stroke in the subthalamic nucleus, okay, which you'll recall results in hemibolismus. Okay, the opposite side of the body has wild flinging movements. That's a hyperkinetic movement disorder. The patient's moving too much. So why does that happen? Well, if we have a lesion here, notice before it was two positive output of glutamate, but because part of this was destroyed, we now put out less glutamate to stimulate the GPI. If you stimulate the GPI less, then it's gonna put out less GABA. Okay, if we put out less GABA to the ventral anterior nucleus of the thalamus, we're gonna inhibit it less and so it's gonna crank out more glutamate to the motor cortex. Your patient has a hyperkinetic movement disorder. Okay, Parkinson's disease. We have to go through a few extra steps, but in Parkinson's, the patient's making less dopamine in the substantia nigra pars compacta. So they stimulate the D1 receptors less. Instead of two positive, we just have one positive now. 
If you stimulate that less, it's going to put out less GABA to the internal segment of the globus pallidus. If you inhibit this less, it's going to put out more GABA. Okay, and we're going to shut down glutamate, going back to the motor cortex. Okay, it works if we go through the indirect route. So again, we're producing less dopamine, so we inhibit D2 less. So it's going to put out more GABA, which is going to inhibit the external segment of the globus pallidus more. It's going to put out less GABA. We inhibit the subthalamic nucleus less. It's going to put out more glutamate. And it's further going to crank out more GABA, which is even further going to shut down glutamate going back to the motor cortex. Okay, so it really does work um, in just figuring things out in basal ganglia circuitry. Okay, why in deep brain stimulation would putting a stimulator here work? Well, deep brain stimulation is a little bit confusing because when you put a probe here and you stimulate this area of the brain, you actually inhibit its action. Okay, and so you're actually helping to put out less glutamate. Okay, and so therefore you, you can kind of reverse a little bit some of the effects of the Parkinsonism by putting a stimulator um, here. Another common place to put a stimulator is here in the internal segment um, of the globus pallidus. And we'll talk about that in the Parkinson's lecture. Okay, so basal ganglia regulates movement by communicating with upper motor neurons. The cerebellum does the same thing, but with a very different um, and I think more uh, better understood uh, mechanism. All right, so here is a real nice drawing that uh, Josh King, uh, medical student just graduated uh, last year, uh, completed a few months ago. And so uh, the cerebellum, remember, acts as a comparator. It compares intended movement with actual movement and sends that integrated feedback back to the motor cortex so that in real time you're continuously uh, refining movement. So um, let's start out here by just pointing out the cortical spinal tract. Very familiar pathway, traveling here through the posterior limb of the internal capsule, crossing at the pyramidal decussation to activate appropriate lower motor neurons, to activate appropriate muscles. All right, so let's just say you're going to move your hand. Okay, and so the cortical spinal tract would certainly be involved in that. But what happens is um, with any movement, the cerebellum needs to know about that intended movement, okay? And it, it does that through this very important pathway here called the cortico-ponto-cerebellar tract. The name of the pathway tells you exactly what it does. It goes from the cortex to the pons, here are the pontine nuclei, it's a synapse there, and then it crosses over to the opposite cerebellum through the middle cerebellar peduncle. Okay, there's only one pathway that travels through the middle cerebellar peduncle, and it's the cortical ponto cerebellar tract. Okay, notice the cerebellar cortex is really complex, but here's a Purkinje cell out there. All right, so now the cerebellum knows the intended movement, okay, what the brain intended to do with the hand or whatever. Okay, now it needs to know the actual movement. And so not really shown here in any detail, but in the muscle, in muscle spindles and in Golgi tendon organs, every precise little bit of movement is relayed up to the cerebellum through these spinocerebellar tracts. Okay, three of the four travel like this through the inferior cerebellar peduncle, say, so they don't cross. Okay, one of them, the ventral spinocerebellar tract, crosses twice. It crosses once in the spinal cord, and it crosses again here as it goes through the superior cerebellar peduncle. The net result is the same, okay? So now the cerebellum knows the intended movement, it knows the actual movement, it compares the two, and then it sends a feedback pathway back up to the motor cortex, okay? And this, importantly, goes through the superior cerebellar peduncle, okay? On its way, it goes through the thalamus, okay, for the cerebellum, the ventral lateral is the most important nucleus of the thalamus, and then back up to the motor cortex. Okay, so that's just very simplistically um, how the cerebellum works. And now we can understand why um, here is a patient that has a left cerebellar hemorrhage. 
and we know that the ataxia is ipsilateral. So why is it ipsilateral? Well, if our lesion is here in the left cerebellar hemisphere, the left cerebellum is involved in communicating with the right cerebral cortex, which moves the left side of the body. Okay, so the ipsilateral, the ataxia with cerebellar lesions is ipsilateral. Okay, so here's a more detailed picture. Um, so there are, I didn't point out here, um, these are not labeled, but there are deep cerebellar nuclei that have a specific function um, with regards to the cerebellum. So the largest is down here, it's called the dentate nucleus which is the most important output nucleus here that goes back to the motor cortex. So you can see here highlighted the VL, ventral lateral, is the most important thalamic nucleus um, as it relates to the cerebellum. Okay, so don't panic on this slide. There's an important point to be made. Um, we said that the vermis, the midline portion of the cerebellum, is mainly important in coordinating midline truncal musculature. Why is that? Well, notice that this midline portion of the cerebellum is communicating um, here with upper motor neurons that we just talked about in the brainstem, the vestibular nuclei, the uh, reticular formation for the reticular spinal tract. And we said that those are midline musculature, right? So the cerebellum is provides the same kind of feedback here to upper motor neurons in the brain stem that are important for truncal musculature. So the more medial the lesion is of the cerebellum, the ataxia is going to be midline. And your patient will have a wide-based gait and mainly truncal ataxia. The further lateral the lesion is, now you're involving areas of the cerebellum that are communicating with the motor cortex for fine distal motor control. So you're going to have more of a finger-to-nose uh, type of ataxia uh, with a lesion there. Okay, and I'm just kind of cherry picking here some important information. Um, all input to the cerebellum we call mossy fibers. Okay, the exception to that is information from the inferior olivary nucleus that goes to the cerebellum, and we call these climbing fibers. Okay, and so here's the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So these climbing fibers will get to the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, why is that worthwhile pointing out? Um, well, so here are climbing fibers coming from the inferior olive, and these have a very strong excitatory uh, glutamate uh, connection here with Purkinje cells. Okay, mossy fibers, um, very complex what happens to mossy fibers, but I would know that the climbing fibers are unique in their strong connection with Purkinje cells. So a lot of things happen in the cerebellar cortex that um, I think you probably don't need to know. Um, for example, there are as many cells here in the granular layer as the entire rest of the nervous system, believe it or not. So a lot happens in terms of cerebellar circuitry, but importantly, 100% of the output of all that happens in the cerebellar cortex is via Purkinje cells. And notice that this is GABAergic, okay? So this is inhibitory going out of the cerebellum in contrast to uh, climbing fibers, which are excitatory uh, to the Purkinje cells. Okay, one other thing I'll mention, just because there's a clinical correlation here, uh, Mollerase triangle uh, which is an internal circuit here that's important for the cerebellum, it goes from the red nucleus. Remember, that's where the rubrospinal tract originates, but it also has a cerebellar function. Okay, there's a connection between the red nucleus and the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum with the inferior olivary nucleus and the red nucleus. And this connection between the red nucleus and the inferior olive is called the central tegmental tract. Okay, and this pathway, um, if you have a lesion here, interestingly, you get something that's known as palatal myoclonus. Okay, these patients have a palate which is continually bouncing up and down, up and down, uh, continues during sleep. It's very annoying. It causes a little clicking sensation in the ear. And so if you see a patient with that, you know it's a problem with this pathway. 
So the lesion is usually going to be in the pons somewhere here between inferior ala, which is in the medulla, and the red nucleus, uh, which is in the midbrain. All right, let's talk a little bit about eye movements. Uh, there are three types of conjugate eye movements. Conjugate means the eyes are moving together and tracking. Okay, and we use all three of these um, at every moment. All right, so there are two that fixate the image on the retina. One is the vestibular ocular reflex. So when you try to fixate, like I'm looking at the computer screen, move my head back and forth. Uh, as I move my head, there's flow of endolymph in the semicircular canals. And that is able to communicate with, um, we'll, we'll show the anatomy here in the brainstem that can perfectly move my eyes appropriate to head position. That's the vestibular ocular reflex. Visual pursuit involves tracking something. Okay, and so imagine you're on a train and you're following a car or something, you're gonna track that. So we need to see for that. So this comes from the occipital lobe, okay? And then we have a very important eye movement, conjugate eye movement that redirects the line of sight. So imagine we've been tracking something on the train and now we're gonna quickly move our eyes to catch up with another object and follow it. And that quick movement is called a saccad, a visual saccad. And the anatomy of this uh, pathway is uh, very well understood and has some important clinical uh, applications. So we use all three of these all the time. So if you're walking, you know, your eyes are moving appropriately related to head position. That's vestibular ocular. You're always looking at things. So you have visual pursuit um, active and our, our eyes are moving around as we move from one object to another. That's visual saccades. So these all work together. So let's talk about uh, the saccadic pathway. This originates here in the frontal eye fields. Okay, and I showed where this travels in the anterior limb of the internal capsule but its destination is the opposite brainstem. And really you should lump these two together, PPRF and six as a kind of a, we call it a PPRF six nerve complex. Okay, and so the big picture is the left brain is always wanting to move the eyes to the right. The right brain is always wanting to move the eyes to the left. Um, normally they're equally counterbalanced. So how does the left brain move the eyes to the right? Well. If you activate the opposite PPRF6 nerve complex, okay, notice that six is gonna supply the lateral rectus. It's gonna move the right eye to the right. Okay, now to get the left eye to move along, we need to activate the medial rectus. Medial rectus is supplied by the third nerve. So this important pathway here, the MLF or the medial longitudinal fasciculus is the pathway that specifically communicates between PPRF6 and the opposite side of the pons with the part of the third nerve that activates the medial rectus. Okay, so your eyes contract together as they move to the left. Okay, now I've included the cortical spinal tract here, our upper motor neuron pathway, um, because we want to make some clinical applications um, of this. Okay, one is if we have a big stroke out here. The middle cerebral artery supplies all of this, cortical spinal tract and the frontal eye fields. Okay, so what's going to happen? Let's say we have a left MCA stroke. Okay, what side of the body is going to be weak? Well, it'd be the opposite side, of course, right? So we're going to have a right hemiplegia. Okay, so the patient is kind of looking at the screen here, so the right arm and leg will be weak. Now, which way will the eyes be deviated? Well, Remember that the left frontal eye fields are wanting to move your eyes to the right, okay, by activating the opposite PPRF6 to move your eyes to the right. So if you destroy the left frontal eye fields, what happens is the opposite pathway from the right hemisphere, which wants to move your eyes to the left, it's now relatively overactive. And so what happens is your eyes can't look to the right and they get driven to the left. So here the patient looking is looking at the screen, the eyes are looking to the left. And so I think it's much easier to remember this as uh, in terms of whether the eyes look at the hemiplegia or away from the hemiplegia. Most review books will talk about the eyes look at the lesion or away from the lesion. But when you walk into the emergency room to see a patient who's had a stroke, you don't know where the lesion is yet. And so if you just look in at the patient and you see, okay, right side of the body is weak, 
the eyes are looking away from the hemiplegia, now the lesion has to be cortical, almost always a middle cerebral artery stroke. So eyes look away from the hemiplegia in an MCA stroke. Exactly the opposite if we put our lesion in the pons. Okay, so which way are the eyes going to look if we have a right pontine lesion? And to answer that question, just ask yourself, what does the right pons normally do? It normally wants to move the right eye to the right, and it normally wants to move the left eye to the right. So if you destroy that, the eyes can't look to the right, they get driven to the left by the PPRF6, not shown, but you know, that is here in the left pons. So with the right pontine lesion, the eyes get driven to the left. Now what side of the body will be weak? Okay, here's the cortical spinal tract coming from the right hemisphere. So, of course, this is always supplying the opposite side of the body, right? So if we have a right cortical spinal tract lesion, we're going to have a left hemiplegia. So notice the eyes now look at the hemiplegia. Okay, so if the eyes are looking at the hemiplegia, don't be thinking cortex, middle cerebral artery stroke. You should be thinking the lesion is in the brainstem uh, specifically in the pons. <clears throat> and so we call this a gaze palsy. And when we have an MCA stroke, we call it a gaze preference. Okay, and later on, uh, we'll explain the difference and why the terminology um, is used. Okay, another really important application of this is if we have a lesion of the MLF. Remember that the MLF is invested in the part of the third nerve nucleus that supplies the medial rectus. So if we have an MLF lesion here on the left, okay, now the patient is looking at you, and when the patient looks to the left, no problem, okay, because the, you know, the only problem is going to be it's with the left medial rectus. That's involved in looking to the right, okay, so that now when the patient tries to look to the right, notice that the left eye can't look to the nose. Okay, the right eye, or the, the brain, I should say, tries to bring the images together, so we get some nystagmus here in the normal eyes that attempts to bring the two images together. <clears throat> so this is called an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Internuclear, between the lesion, because the lesion is between nuclei. It's between PPRF6 and 3. And ophthalmoplegia is just a big word for an eye movement problem. All right, so if you have an INO lesion, um, this is classic for multiple sclerosis, okay? So, um, and in fact, multiple sclerosis often will get both MLF pathways here from a single demyelinating lesion, and then we get a bilateral um, internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Okay? And so if this will work here, I'll show you a little uh, video of a patient with a bilateral look in the distance. Look at my pen. Look at my finger. Neither eye can look well to the nose. Pen, finger. The bilateral I and O. Pen, finger. Pen, finger. We'll do vertical saccades. Uh, pen, finger. Pen. You need to see that a few times. So let's watch it one more time. It's a bilateral I and O. Neither eye looks to the nose very well. Look at my pen, look at my finger. Pen, finger, pen, finger, pen, finger. Okay, so you need to look at those um, a, a lot. Eye movements are difficult. Uh, I find it most helpful to look at the bridge of the nose, so you're kind of looking at what both eyes are doing uh, simultaneously. All right, the vestibulo-ocular reflex. So again, we know that this um, allows our eyes to fixate with respect to head movement. Okay, so we use the term uh, oculocephalic or doll's eyes. Usually we do this in a patient who's unresponsive in a coma. We move their head back and forth. And so the normal should be if you move your head to the left, the eyes should be driven to the right and vice versa. <coughs> a very powerful way of activating vestibulo-ocular reflex is using cold caloric testing, okay? So this shows cold calorics, but first let me just illustrate. Here's our vestibular apparatus, the semicircular canals. 
And so normally, um, when you turn your head to the left, the eyes want to go to the right. So when you turn your head to the left, you're activating flow of endolymph in these semicircular canals. And this actually act activates the opposite PPRF6 to move your eyes to the right via the anatomy that we've just talked about. All right, so cold calorics would be much easier to understand if we put hot water in the ear, because hot water acts more towards the normal physiology. It would activate this pathway. But of course, hot water can damage the tympanic membrane. And so we use cold water. And so the trick to remember here is that cold water inhibits this pathway. So the normal thing, if we were to just inject cold water in the in left ear of a normal individual, what you actually end up doing is you inhibit the opposite PPRF6 nerve complex. And remember that wants to drive the eyes to the right. Okay, so if you inhibit that, the eyes get driven to the left. Okay, so the normal response with cold water in the left ear, we can see is that the eyes move slowly to the left. Now, the brain tries to overcome that. And so we get the fast phase of the nystagmus here from the frontal eye fields. All right, so it then activates the PPRF, which was just inhibited, to move the eyes quickly uh, now back to the right. So cold calorics in a normal individual drives the eyes slowly to the side where you're giving the cold water, and then the frontal eye fields from the cortex kicks in and the eyes go fast back to the other side. So remember, we name nystagmus completely arbitrarily by the fast phase. So cold water in the right ear results then in a right beating nystagmus. That's just named after the fast phase. Okay, so this will be very important when we talk later about how do you localize lesions in a coma, and cold calorics can be helpful for that. Uh, you have to know the normal of, of how this works before we can understand abnormal. <laughs> All right, so if we have a lesion, um, let's say we have a left horizontal canal lesion, okay, where we're losing this output, this normal output here, it looks just like giving cold water. The eyes will come slowly to the left and fast to the right. Now, the posterior uh, semicircular canal is probably the most important one to be familiar with. This is complex <clears throat> because if you want to know how the posterior semicircular canal works, um, let's just say we wanted to isolate the action of the right posterior semicircular canal. And to do that, I would suggest just pausing the video, um, look at yourself in the mirror as you tilt your head back into the right. And what you see when you tilt your head back into the right if you're fixated on something, is that your eyes will slowly intort down in the opposite direction. Move your head back to the right, the eyes will slowly tort down to the left. Okay, why is that important uh, to know about? Because an extremely common condition called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, almost always because of gravity, involves the posterior semicircular canal. And what happens in benign positional vertigo is these otoconia fall down into the posterior semicircular canal and they activate that canal. Okay, and so just what you did moving your head back and to the left, that canal is now always trying to do that. It's always trying to move the eyes down into the opposite direction. Okay, and so um, when we do our test for benign positional vertigo, um, called the dix hall pike test, where we have the patient lie down, uh, you are going to stimulate that pathway. And so typically then what will happen is you get the eyes, they go down to the opposite direction and the brain quickly turns them back. So you get an upbeating, uh, if the lesion's on the right, it'll be an upbeating nystagmus with a fast phase uh, towards the involved ear. And so that's just diagnostic for benign positional vertigo. And when you do that, you need to apologize to the patient and say, we need to do this one more time. And the reason you need to do it again 
is when you have the patient lie down a second time, usually nothing happens or it's much less dramatic. And that's because you just flushed out those otoconia uh, the first time that you did the test. So the, the reaction to the Dix-Hallpike fatigues, and that's very suggestive then of um, benign positional vertigo. All right, so this is another drawing that um, I found very helpful for eye movements. Um, it's pretty detailed, and I think uh, maybe I won't go over this except to make one point here. So um, here's our MLF pathway. So we talked about an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. Now, we can have a larger lesion here that involves not only the MLF, but maybe also the ipsilateral PPRF and six. And this is called the one and a half syndrome. Okay, and you have to really spend some time thinking about this because the one and a half syndrome, it's gonna affect the lateral rectus here. So this eye is not going to AB duct. It actually is gonna affect this MLF, the ipsilateral MLF, but also the MLF that comes from this PPRF six nerve complex to the other erectus. So neither eye can move to the nose. So really the only eye muscle, the only horizontal eye muscle that works uh, with this one and a half syndrome is the opposite uh, of Dusen's nucleus, okay? And so um, this is another kind of variation on the theme of a medial longitudinal fasciculus lesion. So here's a patient with a bilateral INO and- This patient presents- And I'll just say one thing, the, Pons is very important for vertical eye movements. I'm sorry, the pons is important for horizontal eye movements, the midbrain for vertical eye movements. And so um, when patients have one and a half syndrome, the lesions in the pons, they have relatively good up and down eye movements, but their horizontal eye movements are severely affected. And the other thing I'll point on the drawing here after we show the video is that convergence looking towards the nose um, is preserved when we have these lesions in the pons. So as we watch this patient's eye movements, notice the only thing she's really able to do is to uh, abduct the left eye. With double vision, she cannot look fully to the right, horizontal gaze palsy, looking left, a right into nuclear ophthalmoplegia, abducting nystagmus of the left eye, paresis of the right medial rectus. Good convergence, Full up gaze with upbeat nystagmus. Okay, so the thing I'll just point out here is that the um, the nucleus here for convergence, you can see that is spared in patients that have these lesions that involve the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Okay, so that's why they can uh, look to the nose. Well, even though they can't track to either side that involves uh, the medial rectus. All right, so here's a lesion um, in the pons and a lesion right there that could certainly give you a one and a half syndrome or uh, an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And if you're finding lots of other subcortical lesions in a young patient, then this most likely represents multiple sclerosis. Okay, vertical eye movements, I won't go over um, here, but uh, all of this is very well understood in terms of why, um, how, for example, the posterior semicircular canal can activate specifically individual nuclei here involved for three or for four to move your eyes in a very specific direction. And we have different anatomy here involved in vertical eye movements, but I'm not gonna go over that. It's a lot more complex. Okay, and then let's finish up here talking a little bit about uh, visual fields. We like to use the confrontation method when checking visual fields. So you align yourself with the patient, they cover one eye, you cover the corresponding eye, and then you hold up fingers to check um, all four quadrants, okay? And so the basic uh, anatomy here, um, you need to think of vision in terms of the uh, temporal retina and the nasal retina, okay? So what does the nasal retina see? Well, the nasal retina is going to see the temporal visual field. So here we've got 
our temporal visual field, that vision is going to strike the nasal retina, whereas the temporal retina will see the nasal visual field. Okay, so we have the retina, the optic nerve, and notice here that it's the nasal retinal fibers that cross here at the optic chiasm, whereas the temporal retinal fibers um, stay on the same side. Okay, so we have an optic tract, the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and then optic radiations back to the primary visual cortex um, in the occipital lobe. All right, so here is the optic nerve, optic chiasm. And this just shows you a little bit of the optic tract right here. And the lateral geniculate is this Napoleon-shaped hat here, a very distinctive appearing nucleus for vision. And then we have the optic radiations here going back to um, primary visual cortex or striate cortex. Okay, and so here uh, primary visual cortex would align um, here around um, in this area. Macular vision here is back at the tip. All right, so um, again, this shows a little bit better here what I was talking about earlier, that the temporal retina sees the nasal visual field. The nasal retina sees the temporal visual field. Okay, so that's just very important to, to keep in mind. So we'll talk about lesions here, either of the optic nerve, of the optic chiasm, optic tract, radiations, and extending back here to uh, visual cortex. So if you have a lesion anterior to the optic chiasm, you're always going to have monocular visual loss. Okay, and we will talk about specific conditions that affect the retina um, and the optic nerve, and we'll talk about the vasculature. But if our lesion is on the left, we'll have some form of monocular vision loss. Okay, vision loss is in the left ipsilateral eye. Okay, if we have a lesion of the um, optic chiasm, okay, remember what crosses at the optic chiasm? It's the nasal retina fibers. What does the nasal retina see? It sees the temporal visual field. So that's why if we have a pituitary adenoma right here, we're going to get this bitemporal uh, hemianopia. Okay, and I'll bring this up just because I saw this as a UWorld question. Um, the question was, the patient has a, um, a nasal visual field defect in one eye, okay? And, and what they wanted you to choose was the lesion was right here, okay? Because remember, the temporal retina does not cross. So I think the situation was a aneurysm of the internal carotid artery compressing right here, affecting the temporal retina. So that would give you a nasal a visual field defect. Okay, really rare. I've never seen that, but kind of a theoretical exercise in understanding these uh, visual pathways. All right, now as we move back here to the optic tract, so now our lesion is here. The visual fibers are in rotation in the optic tract. And so um, Practically, the significance of that is you're going to have a contralateral visual field defect, but it's incongruous. What that means is it's not identical from side to side. Okay, so um, here the lesions on the right. The patient here is looking at the screen, so they have a left homonymous hemianopsia, but it's not identical from side to side. It's incongruous, and that's characteristic of an optic tract lesion. The further you get back here in the visual pathways, the more identical the visual loss is going to be um, in both eyes. Okay, now if our lesion here is in the optic radiations, if we affect the optic radiations that loop down into the temporal lobe, we tend to get something smaller than a whole quadrant. Okay, so we'll pie in the sky. Okay, and uh, so that kind of a defect, you know the lesion is in the temporal lobe optic radiations. The parietal lobe optic radiations are larger, and so we tend to get a, you know, bigger than a quadrant here if we have an um, um, optic radiation parietal lobe lesion. Now, if we have a middle cerebral artery stroke, 
then that would be like lesion six here, an MCA stroke. That's going to affect all the optic radiations. And so the patient will have a contralateral homonymous, pretty equal from side to side, uh, hemianopia. Okay, so that's an MCA stroke. Middle cerebral artery supplies the optic radiations. All right, a lesion in the occipital lobe, especially if it's a PCA stroke, results in a contralateral homonymous hemianopsia, hemianopia, but the macular fibers have a dual blood supply. Okay, they're supplied back here by the MCA and the PCA, and so you get macular sparing. Okay, so if you see that, you know it's a PCA stroke. Now, I mentioned that the... Uh, Macular fibers are back here at the tip of the occipital lobe. So sometimes we'll see patients, especially after head trauma, that will damage the occipital lobe, and they can get this kind of bilateral, in this case, bilateral paracentral homonymous hemianopsia. If you see something like this, um, here's the blind spot here, but if you see this bilateral central visual field defect, um, could be related to trauma of the occipital lobe. Okay, so I think I'll talk a little bit about some visual function anatomy next time. Um, probably enough information for now.